uh, it's time to, to start uh, our meeting. Uh, first of all, uh, I will introduce our speaker, Professor Sebastian uh, Glad. Uh, Sebastian Glad studied at the University of Vienna and did his PhD at the pharmaceutical industry. In 2008, he joined the structural and computational unit at EMB, EMBL Heidelberg as a postdoc. There, he transformed from a pure cell biologist into a protein biochemist, crystallographer, and electron microscopist. Since September 2015, he leads his own independent Max Planck research group at Małopolska Center of Biotechnology of the Jagiellonian University in Prague. He established and maintained fruitful scientific collaborations with leading labs around the world. He has published in highly prestigious scientific journals, and he has received uh, several prestigious grants, including the ERC Consolidator Grant 2020, EMBO Grant, as well as several grants from Foundation for Polish Science and National Science Center. He is not only leading an international research team of more than 30 young scientists, but he is also deputy director of science at Małopolska Center of Biotechnology and head of the National Creo Electron Microscopy Facility at the Solaris Synchrotron in Krakow. On top of this, recently Sebastian Glad uh, obtained, uh, obtained the NCN Award. Uh, if we can, uh, if we can, uh, uh, I, I would like to ask uh, Sebastian to uh, to activate camera and microphone, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. We are very proud to to have you in in this uh, lecture series. Uh, and please now share the, your presentation and we can start. Can you see it and hear me? Yeah, it's perfect, it's perfect. Okay. Sebastian, I see the multiple screens on my display. Mm -hmm. Did you click something? No. no. Oh, let's go. I think, let's I go. think it's okay. okay. So you can start, the digital floor is yours. Please start. Okay, so first of all, thanks a lot for the for the opportunity and and uh, uh, the Polish Biochemis Biochemical Society for inviting me and and basically letting me present our most recent uh, research work. Um, it's a great pleasure, and I, I really really uh, um, would love to see uh, to see you all in person. Um, but I think uh, the online meeting also allows a lot of people from all over. Poland actually to 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 join the, the the seminar without. I would also like to say that today I'm I'm going to present quite how to say scientific biochemical uh, um, insights of the, at the for the experts. Um, but I also will have um, a presentation at the at the Copernicus Center uh, in, in December, where we will actually I will rather actually explain the very basics of of of, of transcription and translation. Or protein synthesis in eukaryotes, because I think it's an it's an essential um, part of, of what we're doing, but also that um, people actually understand a bit better how these modern vaccines work and why these mRNA vaccines are actually so much better than 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 the previous ones. Um, today, I will focus on um, the so-called translational control of eukaryotic uh, gene expression, um, but I would like to start with uh, thanking and acknowledging my team and the funding bodies. I have the, the pleasure to, to head a, a very international, uh, very active and very fun uh, team of, of young scientists at the, at the MCB in, in, in Krakow. Um, I um, was lucky enough to get some of the nice grants. So I'm really thankful to obviously the ERC and, and EMBO and, and but also of course FMP, the ministry and, and NCN for, for supporting us uh, financially as, as partners um, in our, our science. Um, I, will, I will focus today on, on, on the very core activities of the lab, but I should also say that we are exploring a lot of new avenues, and I hope uh, when the stories are more progressed, I will be uh, happy to come back and, and tell you more about the, the, the other research uh, uh, that we are doing. Um, 
The MCB uh, is a big success story, and, and these are the papers that we actually published since, since I arrived six years ago. So I think we are really keeping the uh, world-class ambition that we have. Um, 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 we, we, we stick to our, our ambition, and we be able to actually publish high-profile papers out of, out of Krakow. Um, and obviously, the new microscopes will help us um, us and also the other community to actually um, um, really do structural biology on the, on the world class level. Um, I'm also very thankful to a lot of um, uh, collaboration partners. So these are the, here, here the ones that are listed are the, are the main partners, but, but I, I, we are working with a lot of different labs, uh, especially in the field of, of cryo-electron microscopy. Um, so to introduce you to the main topic um, of, of the lab, um, uh, there's a kind of a, a key word, uh, which is called epitranscriptomics. So this is a very broad field, um, but it basically summarizes the, is summarized by saying that this is the translational control by specific RNA modifications. So as most of you know from the textbook, um, protein synthesis is regulated or gene expression is regulated in eukaryotes. Um, via uh, transcriptional control. So you have chromatin remodeling, you have transcription factors, you have obviously the RNA polymerases that make the, the mRNA molecule. And this mRNA molecule is then uh, exported to the cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm, um, this mRNA or the information that is encoded in the mRNA is decoded by, uh, with the help of the ribosome, but foremost actually decoded by these uh, small RNA molecules, which are called uh, tRNAs or transfer RNAs that then attach the amino acid uh, and give rise to a fully nascent polypeptide chain that then folds into an active enzyme and carries out the cellular functions. Um, so this is, this is the textbook knowledge, but what people maybe are less aware of are that these RNA molecules, uh, particularly the tRNA molecules, but also mRNA molecules, but also the ribosomal RNAs, in fact, are heavily modified by uh, uh, small, with small chemical modifications. And these uh, small, modifi small modif modifications are not just randomly introduced, but there are specific tRNA or RNA modification enzymes that carry out this job. And they actually dynamically regulate these, um, these RNAs um, to then control the protein synthesis. Um, the uh, universe of RNA modifications is, is really is, is much bigger than the, modifi the post translation modifications in, in, in proteins that we know. So currently we have knowledge of about 170 unique RNA modifications, and this should just summarize that these modifications are happening in all um, kingdoms or domains of life. Um, but also that these modifications can be virtually attached to almost every single position of an RNA base. So we are talking about a code on top of a, a, a code. Um, there are two main scenarios that we also discriminate. And so, so here on the one hand, um, the same types of RNAs, RNA modifications, in this case, for example, pseudouridine, um, can be introduced by a single enzyme uh, in different RNA types. So, so here we have a single modification and we can track this uh, in different RNAs. The other uh, scenario is that we actually have a single tier, a single RNA species that is modified by different modification enzymes. And so here, just to highlight this, uh, the, the tRNAs, the transfer RNAs are really a hotspot of, of modifications. Um, so these are relatively short RNA molecules that are heavily modified. Um, in particular, the anticodon stem loop region, which is here depicted on the, on the left, uh, and, and highlighted or, or zoomed in on the right. Um, so this is really a hotspot of modifications. And so here you only see those modification or modification enzymes that are modifying these few bases uh, uh, at the absolute center of the decoding activity. So how are these things working? Um, so on the one hand, you have tRNA modifications that are, are for sure um, are, are, are enabling the correct folding of the, of, the, of the tRNA molecule. But when we are looking at the anticodon modifications that are responsible for decoding the, um, the mRNA, um, what we see is that these anticodon modifications, in fact, uh, regulate the speed of the translating ribosome during the elongation phase. So uh, in very simple terms, when you have a modified tRNA, the ribosome can read the mRNA correctly. It's uh, translating and decoding and translocating at the correct speed. 
And then the protein that comes out of it is folded correctly. If we don't have these tRNA mod anticoder modifications, the ribosome is slowed down because the decoding uh, um, takes longer than, than for the modified tRNA. And this, this uh, slowdown leads to misfolded aggregated protein. So this is, this is uh, important and uh, just, is, uh, just to remind you that the proteins that are produced by the ribosome, in fact, they immediately start folding when they come out of the exit tunnel. There's even some data that they start folding when they're actually still in the, in the exit tunnel. But you can now, I think, imagine that when the, 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 the speed of the ribosome of how fast it's actually translating the information has quite a strong impact on how fast this chain comes out here, and this regulates the folding dynamics or co-translational folding dynamics of the nests and proteins. Um, and this is not only important because, because we, we want to understand it, but this is also highly relevant uh, for us as, as potential patients. Um, so many uh, tRNA modification enzymes um, have been identified in patients, or have been identified as mutated in patients uh, with neurodegenerative diseases, cancer, but also metabolic diseases or mitochondrial linked uh, um, diseases. And here on the left, you simply see only those positions that have been clinically relevant or identified to be connected with a particular human, human disease. Um, so we have been studying a very complicated system and I will, I will come to this, um, which, is, which is targeting uridine bases that are pos positioned in the so-called wobble base position. So position 34 of the tRNA. So what you can see here is a, is a uridine, and this is, um, this is um, modified by MCM5. So this is basically an acetyl group coupled to an, a methyl group. And this uh, small modifications is carried out or conducted by the elongator complex, which is known to regulate around 500 proteins at the cell in the same time. Um, one of the things that uh, this is, uh, makes it a bit more complicated to study is that um, we know acetylation reactions from, from lysine residues or from protein side chains very well. So here we have this GCN5 um, acetyl, um, um, acetyl transferase domain. And so this basically can take an acetyl CoA um, and then transfer this acetyl group to the, um, the, the lysine uh, side chain of a protein. Um, so this can be done by a single protein. On the left hand, you see that the initial re reaction that is leading to this MCM5 modification um, is also an acetylation, uh, but it's, it's the acetylation of the uridine base or the actually the position five of the uridine base. And so this is not so simple because you actually attach the wrong carbonyl, you have to attach the wrong carbonyl group that is typically very difficult to activate. So that's why we have, in this case, not a single small protein, but we actually have a large, uh, macromolecular complex. We have five regulatory factors, and it is also involves um, radical chemistry because we need to create um, these um, acetyl radical in the center. But I will I will explain this uh, when uh, uh, later in the talk. Um, the, the the machine itself is 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 really big. It's, it's six proteins. Uh, uh, in fact, it's two copies of each of the of these proteins. And when we started this many years ago. Uh, we had actually no real idea how this is, how this, how this complex is organized. Um, so many years ago, I, I managed to, to solve the crystal structure and also here a negative stain EM, um, um, a picture of the L456 uh, subcomplex. And, and this is published data. Um, I will not go into the detail of the structure, but just to show you that there is an assembly of actually uh, um, uh, a dimer of trimers. So you have two copies of each of the subunits, so L5, mm -hmm. L4 and, and L6. And uh, what is quite important is that we realize that the tRNA, that this complex actually recognizes tRNA in the center of its, of, of its, of its core. And that you actually need the hexameric assembly to do that. And um, it also has an intrinsic ATPase activity. And it basically, when it hydrolyzes ATP, it regulates the on and off state of the tRNA. We have also uh, over the years, uh, managed to solve, determine the crystal structures of the enzymatic core protein. So this is the this is ELP3, the ELP3 subunit. And I will not go too much into detail, um, but we recently actually also managed and, and, and published the, the archaeal and bacterial homologs um, together with acetyl-CoA. 
And so we see a very conserved interface of these two domains. So here's this up to transfer race domain. And here we have a radical sum domain that has an iron sulfur cluster. Um, one thing that what is quite important in this case is that in from also crystallography, but also sometimes biochemical um, 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 strategies is when you have such a big complex, you're trying to basically di divide and conquer the, the problem and then study the individual subunits. And we have done this quite successfully over, over the years. But when we started to understand how this whole complex works, we, we got into a bit of a problem because we, we understood that the anticodon stem loop of the tRNA should, is binding to the L456 ring and to the enzymatic subunit at the same time. So if you now envision that these things actually come together in the complex, this and this structure or this, this intermediate can never happen at the same time. So if we continue to study the individual subunits, we will simply not understand how this molecular machine is working. So um, what, we, what we did next is we started the uh, kind of endeavor of uh, electromicroscopy. Um, for electromicroscopy, you know, don't need uh, so much material, um, but so uh, we could do some kind of brute force approach. So we, we grew 200 liters of, of in a high density fermenter um, of, of a recombinant yeast strain that expresses a tap take elongator subunit. And then with one kilo of yeast, we then after with a specific purification protocol, we ended up with the amazing amount of 50 micrograms of, of, of protein. And um, these 50 micro, micrograms of protein is, is, is really not a lot, uh, but it is sufficient to determine the, the atomic structure of, 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 of a protein complex these days. Um, so we, we, we did some cross-linking experiments and then we, we did also um, determine the electron microscopy or negative stain electron microscopy reconstructions of the full complex end of L123 here on the right. And so, so we could use our previous crystal structures to nicely explain at least parts of the, of the structure. And as you can see here, the, the, this hexameric green, which nicely the crystal structure fits very nicely in, is in fact missing here on the L123 subunit. But as you can probably appreciate is that the, 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 the detailed, uh, the detail uh, with negative stain electron microscopy is simply not sufficient to make any uh, real atomic molecular uh, conclusions. Um, so what we did then, and we published this two years ago, um, we, um, we went to cryo-electron microscopy. Uh, this is a different level of, of, of detail, but it also comes with a lot of additional technical problems. Um, if it works, it's quite fantastic. And I just want to highlight for those that are used to crystal structures. So this is the, the densities that we actually see with electron microscopy. So we really see the, the side chains and, and, and basically the atomic details. Um, the structure also told us a lot about the architecture and, and how these individual subunits are uh, interacting with each other. But at these resolutions, we, we were actually able to also see the iron sulfur cluster of, of, of the enzymatic subunit and even um, the 5 deoxy adenosine, um, which is uh, the cleavage product of the, of the sum molecule that is needed for the, for the reaction. And so here's just a, a short movie uh, illustrating that, um, that we used cryo-EM or single particle cryo-EM to be more precise to determine the atomic structure of the L1 to 3. So, um, but the nice thing about uh, cryo-EM is that in fact also we were able to add the tRNA and we determined the structure uh, of the complex that is bound to the tRNA at, at 4.4 angstrom resolution. And so here you see a small movement of this, of, this, of this arm domain that is actually pushing the tRNA into the active site. But what was very satisfying is that we actually found the, the vowel base position directly in the active site close to the iron supercluster. What we also saw is that the, the binding of the tRNA to the, to the complex induces some, uh, some um, um, change in the conformation of the anticodon stem loop. And these changes, in fact, are responsible for the specificity and the activity of, of the complex. So one of the things that we understood now is that, um, that um, this um, active site of elongator, or this kind of bivalent active site, so the outstill coa uh, hydrolysis center, as well as the the radical generating center, which the iron sulfur cluster and the sun molecule, they are actually quite distant from each other. And um, this is um, um, basically gave us the idea how this, how this active site is then still coordinating very well. So because we, from our biochemical analysis, we knew that the acetyl-CoA 
is hydrolyzed upon binding of the tRNA. So when, you, then when the tRNA binds, the acet, the, there's an acetyl group that is released from acetyl-CoA. And this acetyl um, travels to the, to the active site. And then here at this site, there is a radical waiting that is then creating a so-called acetyl radical. And so the active site is designed, uh, uh, has been designed um, to um, reduce the distance that this very dangerous species, this acetyl CoA, has to travel to be attached to the C5 position of U34. Just to highlight this, if you create an acetyl radical as an intermediate, you have to be very careful because in fact, everything uh, can be acetylated in this stage. So we, we now have a much better understanding how the, the cycle um, uh, of, um, of tRNA modification for these anti, very complicated anticoder modification is working. So we have a, a naked uh, tRNA that comes in and then binds to the one to three complex where it gets modified. And then the ring actually comes in to, um, to help to take out the tRNA after it's modified. And then you have a happy modified uh, tRNA. Another story that I uh, that, that, that this obviously allows us to um, to, 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 to conclude is that, that we, we actually can map all these um, different um, mutations that we find in patients with neurodegenerative diseases um, um, directly to the, to the structure and I try to understand what, what these mutations are doing. And, and here, one of the things that I would like to highlight is that what is quite interesting is that you would expect if the mutations are purely um, affecting the function of the complex, you would expect that uh, mutations in any of the subunits would lead to the same uh, disease and phenotype, and, and this is not what we find. In fact, what we find is that we find different groups of, of, of mutations in different that are associated with different types of diseases in different subunits of the complex, and, and we're actually following this up with, 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 with several projects currently. Uh, and one of the things that I, 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 we have already published this year is that we have found um, specific mutations in the L2 subunit, which is here in yellow, which are responsible for, for um, 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 neurodegenerative diseases, uh, childhood uh, um, um, epilepsy, and, and, and other severe intellectual disabilities in these patients. And so when we, when we make these mutations in vitro, we actually don't find so much of a problem in the complex assembly. Um, but what we find is that these mutations actually severely decrease the tRNA modification activity of, of, of elongator. And we have also shown this with our collaboration partners that this, this is then leading to um, severely reduced tRNA modification that was not only in the patients, but also in mouse models that perfectly recapitulate um, the phenotype, the clinical phenotype. Um, another, um, um, the second part of my, my talk is focusing on something that's very much related to, to elongator and the, and the mobile base uh, uridines, but it is affecting a different um, um, pathway. So, so um, when you look here, so I explained to you how elongator is in fact making this uh, complicated modification here on the C5 position, um, but then a subset of tRNAs also is carrying a so-called tyrolation. So it's a sulfur, a sulfur group on the C2 position of, of, the, of the same base. What is quite important is in to understand that these two pathways, at least in some species, are directly coupled, coupled. And in fact, you need to gain to get the elongator modification first, so that then these so-called UBA4, URM1, NCS2, NCS6 pathway can uh, introduce the, the sulfur on the same um, 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 uh, nucleotide. And so what we have been trying to do for many years now is to understand this whole cascade which is quite complicated, uh, uh, kind of based on a sulfur relay from one protein to another. And then actually the NCS2, NCS6 um, tyrolase is, 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 is conducting the actual um, tyrolase. Um, what I will tell you today is something that we published um, last year. And this is at the core um, uh, activation of the so-called URM1 uh, molecule. Um, and so I want to start this, um, and I took this actually from, from, from Raj, from, our, from my PhD student, but I think it nicely says it's a, it's a quote from, from Aaron uh, Tichenauer that says, whether, whether you want it or not, one day you will find yourself working on ubiquitin. And, and in fact, this is exactly what, what has happened to us, um, even if we are actually were only interested in, in, in tyrannies. 
And so worm one is called the ubiquitin related modifier one. Um, it is um, one of a, a ubiquitin like a protein. So it looks like ubiquitin in fact. Um, and then when you look at the pathways, what is quite striking is that worm one doesn't not only seem to be the oldest um, uh, ubiquitin molecule, but it also uh, has an E1 activa activating enzyme, but it doesn't seem to have E2 and E3 uh, enzymes like all the other uh, ubiquitin-like molecules. Um, so RM1 basically seems to stand at the root of all ubiquitin pathways or ubiquitin-like molecules, but it also has a lot of features that we know from this, the, the prokaryotic uh, sulfur carrier proteins, which also do like look like, like ubiquitin, in fact. And so what you can see here is basically uh, URM1 represents a hybrid model of, of, the, of, of these two classes of, of, of proteins. And so uh, recently we even got to know that there's another uh, similarity because uh, in fact, this, um, this, this um, intermediate here is actually also closer to the ubiquitin than, than, than we in fact uh, thought. So um, just to walk you through this very quickly is that we start with an URM1. And then the URM1, in fact, gets adenylated. And then the C terminus of the, of the URM1 um, becomes a tyroester. And then the tyroester, in fact, um, becomes persulfided. And this persulfide leads to a so-called tyrogaboxylated URM1. So the tyrogaboxylated C terminus, which carries this additional sulfur group, is very much known from the sulfur carrying proteins, but is absent from all of the other ubiquitin-like uh, molecules. And then the idea was that URM1, or this targoboxylated URM1, can then donate the sulfur to the tRNA, or it can attach itself like ubiquitin to other proteins. So what we did, and this is the really fantastic work of, 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 of Marta from a previous postdoc in the lab and, and, and Raj, which is still a current PhD student in the lab, uh, in collaboration with Sebastian Weidel at, 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 in Switzerland at the Bern University. So we. So we, so we managed to solve the crystal structure of the full length uh, UBA4 molecule, which is this E1 uh, protein that is carrying out the adenylation and the, and the persulfidation of, of, of ORM1 uh, in the upper state. And then we tested a lot of um, 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 mutations uh, that we for the first time actually saw in the, in the structure. Um, and then what was striking is that we can actually measure the adenylation activity by the release of, of phosphate. And so we saw that the obvious um, uh, um, active site residues in the adenylation domain, they are reducing the, the activity, the adenylation activity. But what was quite interesting or intriguing is that in fact, when we, when we mutated residues in the rhodonase domain, we actually even promote, promoted the, the adenylation uh, activity. Um, all of these residues are very important for the uh, the tyranny tyrolation. So we, we, we checked this uh, in vivo in, in yeast strains, and we checked also the actual tyrolation levels of, of the tyrannies. Um, one of the things that we knew is that there is a specific tyroester intermediate formed between UBA4 and worm one And so we used this um, biochemical trick by mutating a cysteine to a lysine to create a covalently linked intermediate. So when we, when we form this, when, this other, when the, the URM1 is, is adenylated and it sees this lysine residue, it in fact, it forms a, a isopeptide bond between this lysine and the C-terminus of URM1. And this trick here allowed us to also crystallize the complex of, of URM1 with, with UBA4. And what you can see here is that the C-terminus of URM1 is really nicely penetrating into the, into the cavity where, where this tyroester is formed. So in this case, it, it mimics the tyroester because here we have this lysine residue that we, that we introduced. Um, what was um, quite striking is that this confirmation of, of, of UBA4 uh, with worm one is in fact very similar to known E1 and, and uh, um, 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 E1 and UBL proteins. So here we have, for example, UBA2, with, with SUMO, and you see SUMO is actually also reaching with the C-terminals in a similar fashion as, 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 as your one. And then also the sulfur carrier proteins also have a similar, similar architecture. So whatever we looked at, in fact, UBA4 and URM1, again, confirmed that they are actually intermediates between the, between the sulfur carrier proteins and the ubiquitin-like uh, proteins. 
Um, one other thing, and this is more like it's published work, so I will not go too much into detail, but what was quite striking at this, this Rodonese domain, which is then making the second step, so this talk of oxalation, is located in a very similar place as the URM1, and we don't see the Rodonese domain in the crystal structure of the complex. So we do think that the URM1 binding is actually releasing this domain so that it can actually swing out and, and then perform um, the last step of the reaction. And so this is uh, coordinated by Elinka, which we very nicely see coordinated. But as I say, I will not go into too much detail of this regulatory pathway. Um, in summary, we managed to, to figure out how this quite unique uh, E1 enzyme works. And, and it, it binds the ubiquitin-like molecules, in this case, ERM, and, and performs the adrenalation, which we, which we knew before. And then after the adrenalation, we form a tie waster. And then when the tie waster is formed, the rhodonase domain can come in and tyrocarboxylate the C-terminals and this tyrocarboxylated C-terminus uh, ERM1 is then released to transfer the sulfur um, to the TRNAs. Um, one of the things that was quite striking is that when we, when we, when we found, when we produced the tyrocarboxylated ERM um, synthetically, we found actually this very small band here in the absence of oxidative stress, which we were quite curious about because this would mean that the ERM1 in fact, is covalently attached to the E1. And this became quite striking when we actually induced uh, with TBU, which is an oxidative stress, we saw a, a massive increase in these in this, in this conjugates. And these conjugates are really covalent, covalent linkages because when we treat them with, uh, with compounds <coughs> that should release um, um, disulfide uh, bonds or tyrosis, we should actually, we actually see that, that these this, uh, conjugates are resistant to this. What was very striking for us is that when we try the wild type protein, we actually don't see this so much and we have to use this mutant of the tyroester uh, cysteine to induce this conjugation reaction. And so what we then did with, with our mass spec facility at, M at MCB, we actually mapped these conjugation sites and, and, and what you can see is that these, uh, these uh, lysine residues here are the ones that are attacked by UBA4. And what was our conclusion from that is that you need a tyroester intermediate in this case to protect yourself against your own product. So you have to understand in this case, and I will go one slide back, is that the tyrocarboxylated ERM1, which is formed by UBA4, seems under oxidative stress, seems to have the propensity to attach itself to lysine residues that are in its proximity. And when you use the wild type, this doesn't happen, but when you mutate the cysteine that forms this tyroester, you actually see this uh, self formulation quite heavily. And just to remind you, this tyroester intermediate is present in all of the other ubiquitin-like systems as well. And we do think that evolutionary, this tyroester intermediate was formed to protect UBA4 against its own product, so ERM1. But then it stayed on in all of the other ubiquitin systems because um, um, uh, ERM1 is the ancestor of all these systems. I should remind you that the other ubiquitin-like systems don't have this uh, tyrocarboxy group. So there's actually no, not a real need uh, for this tyroester intermediate to protect themselves. So we are, I think we have understood and characterized this oldest ubiquitin-like activation system. And I would, at the very end, because I'm, I'm coming to the end of my talk, I would like to, to also promote our national cryo -EM facility. I think this is quite interesting for, for everyone that wants to do structural biology uh, in, in, in the future. Uh, and so this is, a, uh, this is Solaris Synchrotron. It's very close to, uh, to MCB so, and, 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 the, and the BBB faculty. So here it's a five minute walk. And at Solaris, we actually have a central um, facility that serves already all um, uh, the community of, of structural biologists in, in Poland. And I should also say that the beamlines, which are under the supervision of, of Maciej Kozak from Poznan, are, <clears throat> are beginning to take shape. And we hope that in, in, in one and a half, two years, we will actually be able to have crystallography and, and cryo-EM in very close proximity. Um, the National Cryo-EM Center has um, two microscopes. So it has a Cryos G3i microscope and a Glacios screening microscope. Um, this is a state-of-the-art microscope with a K3 
uh, and Falcon's free uh, direct electron detector with an energy filter. And the Clausius microscope has a Falcon 4 detector, also a direct electron detector, and it is used to optimize and screen your, your grids. Um, so I would I will explain this in, in a second, but basically the, the access to the, the Titan cryos is, is exclusively for academic groups, but it requires you to have preliminary data and it requires you to, to apply to us and to ask for time, which is then for free for you. The Glassius microscope has been operating since this year, and this is a microscope that you can actually call, that you can uh, access without any application, uh, and we will only charge you the running costs. And I think we are talking about uh, 1,700 slot in net uh, per day. So this is the entry level microscope for everyone that wants to um, um, prior electron microscopy. Uh, and you're very much free to, to contact me um, to book your time. Um, the Titan time is allocated by an international um, advice, uh, 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 evaluation panel. And just to tell you that we are heavily overbooked, uh, so we do get more, much more applications from Polish groups than we actually have time. So we get three times more um, requests than we can handle. Um, we are trying to allocate as much time to as many groups as possible, but we're also not interfering with our international experts, which are then telling us who to let go to the, to the, to the microscope. Um, the fifth call is currently under evaluation. Um, and the next application deadline is in spring 2022. So please don't, don't miss it and just go to Solaris and, 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 and apply. Um, where do we go next with the microscopes um, is that there is a large extension of the Solaris um, experimental hole, um, which is already approved and will hopefully start um, maybe even this year, uh, beginning of next year. And then here, there's a specific area that is dedicated for uh, cryo uh, the cryo village, we call it. And so, and so here we will have actually place for, for three microscopes in the end, but the very strong point is that we are going to be direct neighbors to the SACS and to the MX beamlines, which are going to be basically just in front of our, of our um, uh, door. Um, last but not least, I want to highlight that when you want to do cryo -EM, you also have to buy computers. Uh, one of the data sets that we will give to you are between five and 25 terabyte. Uh, this needs uh, more than a laptop to store and to analyze. And so what we have been doing, we have teamed up with PL Grid and with the, with the, um, with the, um, with the groups at, at, at Sufronet from the AGH. And we're currently actually putting different fiber optic cables in between the different uh, buffer systems so that in case that you collect with us and our microscopes, you will also be able to actually directly transfer the data to the supercomputers and then analyze your data uh, directly at, at the AGH um, at, at Sufromet. Um, so with this, I'm, I'm, I'm finished. Um, I would like to thank the whole team, also all the alumni from the team, uh, all the fantastic collaboration partners and the funding agency to allowing us to do the um, um, tyranny modification work that we are, we are successfully doing. So thanks a lot. And I'm more than happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much, Sebastian, for your for your lecture and this uh, advertising part, which I think was was very interesting because it's a new facility and new opportunities for Polish uh, biochemical uh, society. In fact, yeah. Okay, so let's have a look. Uh, as, as you probably remember, uh, you, you can ask the question using this Q and A uh, questionnaire. So it's simply the chat. So let me have a look. Uh, uh, there is a first question. Let me read this question. How is it possible that me RNA could bind to vaccine vector against COVID? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. It's not really related to the talk, I would say. Um, but one of the things that I, I want to I want to highlight here is that, um, and we just we just published actually in, in Feb's letters a, a review about this, is that one of the big um, uh, successes of the latest, especially Moderna and and, and Pfizer, is the uh, vaccines is the incorporation of RNA modifications. So when you look at the patents, um, you will see that the uh, both uh, successful mRNA vaccines actually 
have exchanged all uridines into pseudouridines or derivatives of pseudouridines. And this not only stabilizes the RNA, but it also um, avoids an innate immune response to the RNA, which was the problem with previous generations. And in fact, when you look at the mRNA vaccine from the German biotech company, which I will not mention now, is that they have introduced a lot of the tricks that the others have introduced, but they haven't used pseudouridines, and suddenly the efficiency of the mRNA vaccine went down to 40%. So there's, a, a, there's an ultimate need to actually tell your body that, this, that you should not degrade your mRNA uh, before you are able to produce the protein that you want to get immunogen immunogenic against. So, so, so I think that this is actually also a lesson for all of the people that, that have the fear uh, that these mRNA vaccines will uh, edit your genomes. Uh, in fact, the opposite is the problem. So if, you, if the mRNA is degraded by your body too fast, you will not be able to, to get an immune response. Okay, okay. Uh, the next question, uh, it starts uh, with the compliment for your excellent talk. And the question is the following, how strict are the enzymes which modify wobble U34 and how much it changes function of tRNA? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a, how to say, the fundamental question that we have been how to say, working on for, for quite some time. Um, in fact, the enzymes are so strict that this specific modification only happens on uridines in the wobble base position of tRNAs. We don't find this modification in any other uridine in any other type of RNA. Uh, so this is very unique. And we also now understand from the spatial how to say, requirements of the complex, how the complex is specifically recognizing the shape of a tRNA, because it's not only binding a, an, an RNA base, but in fact, it, it captures the, the distance of, an, of a tRNA very well. And then what we also found in our biochemical analysis is that uh, in fact, the complex binds to different tRNAs in an equally well or with the same affinity, if it's modifiable or not. So, um, but only tRNAs that carry a U34 base can activate the acetyl-CoA hydrolysis, which is then necessary to enter the whole cycle of the modification. So at this stage, the complex does not, does not discriminate between modifiable and non-modifiable tRNAs at the binding state but it is really the triggering of the, of, of the reaction that is, that is making the difference. Um, what it does to the function um, is, a, is a very I'll say, big question. Um, it's definitely um, important enough so that you don't have any severe neurodegenerative disease. So when we, when, we, when we see these mutations, when you see these patients, it is a very severe phenotype, not only in the mice, but also in the patients. Um, these mutations don't, the mutations that we find don't abolish the activity of the complex because probably these patients that have mutations that are so severe, we don't find them because they are lethal. Um, but the mutations that we find reduce the activity to like 30 by 30, 35%. And this is sufficient to have a severe neurodegenerative disease. Um, the complex is also completely conserved from yeast to humans. Um, so I think it highlights how important these these mechanisms, in fact, in, in in fact are. Okay, thank you. Next question: How does the tRNA modification relate to the codon usage frequency? Are rare codons recruiting less modified tRNAs? Yes, a very good question. Is something that has has is still puzzling us a lot. Um, there seems to be. Um, and I should say, maybe I, I start with answering the question like this, is that the default state is modified. So 85% of the tRNAs that we have are actually modified. So it's not some kind of, you know, some extra bonus thing that, that happens, but the tRNAs, that, that, the tRNAs need to be modified to actually be, be, be active. Um, the codon usage, is a very interesting question, especially at higher eukaryotes. And that's why we are moving also a lot into the, into the human and, and mouse systems, is that um, in yeast, um, it's, it's less important, how to say, less prominent because we only have one cell type. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a singular 
a single, single cell organism. And, but what we do find in, in, in higher eukaryotes, especially if you have a central nervous system, um, there are massive differences in the reaction of the different cell types. So for example, these patient mutations that we have found and have characterized um, um, in the latest Nature Communications paper is this is a full uh, CRISPR mouse that has uh, a, a kind of a conventional knock-in. So you have this mutation of elongator in all cells of the organism. But in fact, you only find the, the effect on very specific subtypes of neurons. And we are actually quite puzzled about this. And we do think that this is related to the codon usage uh, of specific proteins that are very important for these types of, 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 of cells. But, but that's something that we are still working on. Thank you. And the almost last question, are known any similar modifications that change bases beyond anticodon sites? Uh, so similar modifications, not really, but there are um, a lot of modifications. So, so every single, so, so every single tRNA molecule carries eight to 12 modifications. And so, as I said, there are different types of modifications. So very often, um, when you think about it, is that um, if you're a tRNA, you need to look like a tRNA because you have to fit into the ribosome and you have to be in a very confined space. So you have to look like a tRNA. Um, there are not so many sequences that can fold into a tRNA shape by itself. And so that's why you have a lot of modifications of tRNAs outside of the anticodon, which are actually important to fold the tRNA molecule appropriately um, in the in the in in the lab, we can simply you know we can heat up the tRNA and, and cool it down so it, it folds properly, but the cells can you know heat themselves up to eighty degrees. Um, so they use these modifications to regulate the folding of of, of the tRNA. And evolutionary, we in fact we also find uh, once we have more modification enzymes, we also have more sequences of tier of individual tRNA. So we see an expand a correlation between the appearance of modification enzymes and uh, sequ sequences that can can be a tRNA. Um, in mRNAs, or I think we are also I mean we are we are also studying pseudouridin quite intensively currently, and that is a very interesting part. And I mentioned in my talk is that this is a modification that happens all over the place. So this affects mRNAs, microRNAs, long non coding RNAs tRNAs, um, SNOW RNAs. And so here the regulation is much more um, important, I think, and it's much more um, 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 dynamic in, in terms of an, a kind of a different metabolic response to specific stimuli from outside. Um, for these anticodon modifications, they are really important so that the proteins can be produced. And so that's why it's really important to have them all the time. Okay, thank you for the response. And uh, we have still one question. Does the expression of ELP subunits differ in different tissues? If so, what's the biological meaning behind it? Yeah, um, we, are, we, are, we are currently writing up a story which was exactly about this. Um, it's a bit still a bit tricky because we also think that we have different expression patterns in different neuronal subtypes. Uh, but this is not so easy to dissect uh, in a way. We do see differences in the different <coughs> uh, tissues. Um, um, but in this case, I want to focus mainly also to say what we do see is we do see differences between the different subcomplexes of elongator. Individual subunits are probably not so important, but these ELP1, 2, 3, and ELP456 sub, uh, subcomplexes they are probably differently regulated. Okay, and the last question I will ask uh, you uh, about this uh, cryo-electron microscopy facility, about the membrane proteins. How do you approach this, uh, this membrane proteins with this technology? Is it proteoliposomes or nanodisks? Uh, did you yeah, try so, that? I mean, we, have, we, have, we, have, we have one, uh, let's say, I don't want to say too much. We have a one. One we, actually, there are some 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 of our users already published uh, membrane proteins. We have one, a very exciting structure coming as well. Um, um, 
you can see that the issues of nature and science are full of, of receptors and, uh, and they are all cryo-EM structures. Uh, so there is a big advantage of studying uh, membrane proteins by cryo-electromicroscopy over crystallization, which was, you know, like, a, you know, like a, um, almost a, a lucky incidence, I would, uh, I would say. Uh, for cryo-EM, this is, this is very good because you can see them. Uh, nanodisks, dep depending on the size of your membrane protein, um, you can use nanodisks, you can uh, use uh, lipid uh, detergents. Um, the microscope will not help you with purification of the membrane protein. And you will still need to have a quite pure sample uh, to put on, on the grids. Uh, one of the advantages is that cryo-EM is also happening at relatively low concentrations. And I just want to say that when what we typically need for one grid is we need three to four microliters of 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 grams per liter. So we need basically two to three micrograms, not milligrams, micrograms of your pure sample to do it. And this opens obviously also a lot of possibilities for um, new purification procedures of endogenous proteins um, and uh, um, direct purifications instead of going through the complication of an overexpression system where you artificially have to introduce many things. But I think the ideal way now is actually to go directly to the endogenous source, purify your membrane protein and, and, and do it. Um, it's a big success story. And, and that's why also a lot of people uh, bought microscopes because it, it makes it much more feasible. Not, not commenting on the purification of membrane proteins, which is uh, it's not easy job. And the last the last question, uh, uh, it concerns again cryo-electron microscope and the and the money. Could you repeat cost of the glacios times yes. per hour? <clears throat> yes. So the so the glacios uh, is um, and obviously now uh, so there's Piotr Chochon from Solaris that is responsible for the pricing. So I I I will not. Uh, how to say, uh, please contact him for a specific, specific invoice. Um, but um, to my knowledge, for academic groups, this is around, I think, 1,750 slotty net uh, per 24 hours. So you can only book it for 24 hours uh, because we need to um, um, prepare the microscope. Uh, the things take, you cannot book it per hour simply because it will take you 24 hours to measure, uh, to, 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 to screen for 10, 15 grids. Um, this is from our experience. These things take a bit longer, uh, but I think the price is very fair. Um, it's also, there is a possibility if your institution wants to buy a bigger number of time uh, uh, over the year, for example, please contact us. And um, one of the things I should also say is that what you are getting for free is our expertise. And we're obviously not just putting you in front of the microscope, but we're actually going to help you uh, to, um, to get the best out of your sample. Um, typically, and I should also say this because a lot of people contact me for the for the Titan time, this is only given through the international uh, evaluation panel. And in the last, in the recent calls, it is very difficult for projects that are probably very good, but don't have any preliminary data on grids uh, to pass the panel, simply because we have a lot of very good projects at later stages and the panel the panel's opinion is there is a second microscope, optimize your sample. If you have a good sample, we will definitely allow you to go to the Titan for free and we're gonna collect 20,000, 25,000 micrographs for you that definitely uh, help you with, with, with the structure. Okay. Sebastian, that almost end. Thanks a lot again for a great lecture and also for this information about new facilities in Krakow.